oral history has a, itself a, a, a history. It dates really from the period after World War II uh, when Alan Nevins and other historians realized that people were no longer writing memoirs, uh, that in fact there was a technology that would permit them to tape record and then transcribe what they um, said to an interviewer and those transcriptions would be placed in an archive for historical research. Uh, since that time, there have been many branches of oral history, ranging from opinion research and folklore all the way to uh, political history and the interviewing of people who were in important uh, places or uh, at particular events that were important. And, um, and so there's a whole spectrum of oral historical work. And one of the leading places at which that work takes place is the Columbia Oral History uh, Center, which is, I think it's now called the Columbia University Center for Oral History. And that's a leading center for oral history. You said one thing uh, that piqued my interest. Why did people start, stop writing memoirs? I think that there was a, a, a tradition of keeping journals that disappeared. I think it disappeared after the telephone. Uh, <laughs> I mean, people used, right. to, used to converse by letters and write journals at night. And uh, and particularly, uh, it, it became evident to people who were writing political history first, I think, that those yeah. sources were drying up. Yeah. How did you uh, come to write the oral history of Ehrman, and uh, what was the process you undertook in writing it? Well, I had been doing oral histories and taught oral history as a subject matter when I was a college teacher. Um, and uh, I received a letter from uh, two associates at a law firm called Wald, Harkrader, and Ross. Um, and they approached me with, the, uh, with a, a cold letter to me, actually, asking me if I would consider doing an oral history of a person they considered uh, to be uh, uh, worth uh, spending time with uh, because of the positions he'd held. And he'd recently had health problems at the firm, and um, they felt that this would be something that would be uh, worthwhile to do as a historical matter. And also, I think they thought uh, that it would be something um, valuable for them themselves, because they were very much um, impressed with him. He was a member of the firm, a counsel to the I firm. I think he was of counsel. Yeah, so he had some position with the firm. What had he done before, before that, that they, they knew that he had been a leading figure? Well, what is it that he had done? This was, a, of course, at the end of his career. This was in the 80s. In the 80s. Yeah. And he'd had, um, he'd had a, a life full of uh, active uh, lawyering. Uh, he'd been a law clerk to uh, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. Um, he'd been a part during World War II of the denazification program in Germany. He had um, gone uh, to the Solicitor General's office and, um, and, and he'd gone to the Justice Department, and he was a Justice Department lawyer um, who essentially created the Civil Rights Office at the Justice Department Solicitor General's Office and handled all of the civil rights litigation, essentially all of it, up until he left. The people in the AG's office do nothing but brief and argue Supreme Court cases. So everybody wants to be there. <laughs> very it was a very elite office. It continues yes. to be. In, in, in a, in a uh, in a profession which is overrun entirely by conceptions of elitism, uh, it, uh, it stands at the pinnacle of the conception, I guess one might say. I think at the time that we're talking about, uh, it did. Yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm not able to speak to what it's like yeah. today. Yeah. I think today, actually, the Solicitor General doesn't quite enjoy the position in the Justice Department. He may be the number three person instead yeah. of the number yeah. two person in yeah. the Justice Department. Yeah. But Nevertheless, it continues to be uh, quite uh, an august yeah. institution, almost, yeah. within the Justice Department. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, a leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu. Welcome.